Hi everyone. Welcome. So today we're going to talk about the different economic systems. But before we begin, we're obviously going to review what we learned last time. Uh, the first, our first meeting on um, intro to economics, we learned about scarcity. What else did we learn? We learned about how scarcity, oh, decision making. Um, we learned about wants and needs. We yeah. learned about, okay, second meeting, we learned about the seven principles. Mm -hmm. Seven principles, I can't even memorize all of them, but as long as you understand what each one means and you know how to apply uh, in the real world, that's the main thing. That's correct. Okay. Jennifer, go ahead. But, um, about the seven principles, um, I remember all of them. I think the first one was scarcity forces trade-offs, right? Um, mm -hmm. The yes. second one was, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip to the third one because I know the third one, thinking at margin, right? Fourth yes. is, is uh, fourth one is incentives sway decisions. The fifth one is trade is good. The sixth one is there is no trade without a market. The seventh one is that there are consequences. Um, and going back to the second one, the first and the second one were quite similar. Um, scarcity forces trade-offs. And then... Um, it's two factors. Something versus something else. Oh, cost versus benefits. Right, that's correct. Good, Good job, oh my goodness. So I think you really thoroughly learned all of them to be able to memorize them. So I think that's a very great benefit that you gained from last meeting. So this meeting is going to be, you know, a less topics, but more in depth. I mean, there's just a lot, a lot of more depth to these topics. Normative decisions is when you have to think about this decision. You have to think about uh, what might be happening in the future and considering the past. Can someone explain what a positive decision is? Someone who haven't spoken before. Oh, Zara. Zara. So a positive uh, decision is when we consider the situation right now at the moment, and it is just what it is, and it is usually very simple things. Yeah, that's 100% correct. Uh, positive decisions are at the moment decisions and we don't really need to consider any factors. Okay, and I think that's a pretty good review. And again, economics is a problem. And what is a problem? Okay, so uh, economy is a problem. Uh, scarcity is a problem because there are limited resources, but unlimited ones. So that's genuinely the problem. A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. She went even beyond what I'm asking. So basically, yes, economic is a problem. What is the problem? The problem is scarcity and scarcity resources and re, re, I mean, scarcity form resources and consumers want the resources and within resources, there's goods and services. The goods and services is what the consumer wants, and the one is unlimited, as was our said. Okay, and that's up our review. Why don't we? Oh no. Why don't we get started? Sorry. Okay, so what, how, and for whom are the three essential questions that society has to make? Look, society has to ask itself when there's scarce scarcity. So the organized way that society provides for their people is known as the economy. Economy, We know that. So whenever there is scarcity in a society, which is always, the society has to make a decision concerning what, how, and for whom. And this is often for products. Say a certain production is producing fruits, right? What are we producing? We're producing fruits. What specifically? Maybe bananas, right? How? Well, we need to find, you know, a tropical place for this specific thing. And then for whom? You know, we need to consider our con customers. So that's our, that's the three things we need to consider in an economy. Yes, what Amy said, whenever there is, there is 
Whenever there's scarcity, there is economy, right? The three essential questions in economics is what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce for. Now that's the three essential questions. Again, what, how, for whom? What to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. And the organized way that society provides for their people is known as economy. You know, how to provide for them, what to provide, and for whom to provide, and that defines the economy. So that's the basic uh, definition of economy. Today we're going to introduce traditional economies, uh, command economies, and market economies. So those are the three main things we're going to focus on. And next time we're going to just talk about capitalism because that's a very, a very big top topic. Okay. And next slide. How does your economy spend money? Think about. In the region that you grew up, let's say you grow up in the US, you grew up in Norway, you grew up in Canada, you grew up in China. How do you think your economy spends their money? Maybe the US spend a majority on military. Uh, maybe Norway spend a large amount on people's healthcare. List five things that you think your economy spends a lot of money on. You can do a little research too. Like depend on the country that you're living in. List five things that you think your economy is spending a lot of money on yeah. as a government. So is there any unique way that you spend money? You know, maybe never spend money on a certain day or thousands on weddings, give large tips or, you know, buy designer clothes. Those are all different types of unique styles of spending money. So Denise said in Australia, social security and welfare, health expenditure. Okay, and Rina said, I put a large amount of money yeah. into investing. I think the um, most important thing that the UK government spends their money on is the healthcare. With like, a, I think they spend about 178 billion per year. Whoa. I, th I think per year, I'm not too sure. Wow. Okay. And what percent is out of their total uh, amount of money is on healthcare? Approximately. Like, yes. I have no clue, but. <laughs> I think it's a lot because I spend about 285 billion on social um, mm -hmm. protection. That's a lot. And another yeah. 116 billion on education. Wow. 20%. Yeah. 20%. Yeah, that is a large amount. Okay, LJ. I was about to say what Ella said, but um, education um, takes, I think, 16% of um, the economy's money. And then um, healthcare takes away 20%, and I'm not sure of the rest, but I know that those are the two main contributing factors. Okay, well, that's something I didn't know about in the UK. Yes, and yeah. uh, Jennifer said, I mean, I feel like a lot of people spend a lot of money on our liabilities. Okay, that is correct, because, yeah, liabilities is the thing that we put our money in. But specifically, from your culture and yourself, what do you, what type of liabilities do you put in? Like liabilities can be anything. It can be, it can be, it can really can be anything. What, what liabilities do you think? Okay, car loans. Okay, that that could be a liability or it could be an asset. And car loans, the car can be a liability or asset the car loans is a part of paying it. Yes, think about that. Housing payments, yes, the basic needs. Uh, as we talked about in our first meeting, people's wants and needs. Cars in the US, they are very inelastic products. We will be talking about elastic and inelastic in uh, our upcoming meetings, but cars are really necessary in the US. If you don't have a car, you can't go anywhere. Okay, and Gino said, you spend a lot of money on video games. Okay, he spends his money on video games. So in conclusion, these traditions and customs of how we spend our money actually controls one from forming an economy. Like the way we spend our money, how we spend our money and for whom we spend our money creates our economy. Our decisions forms our economy.
Sorry, I just left my hand up. Um. Yeah, so basically, to repeat again, these decisions that we make of how much money we spend, for whom to spend for, how we spend it, decides what kind of economy that we form. And that is how economy is formed. Uh, does anyone have any question before we move on? Really want you to understand fully of what we're talking about. So we all be clear in the future. Okay, that means we can move on if no one has questions. Okay, traditional economies. Just looking at the word traditional, what do we think? What do we think? Traditional economies. What can this be? Ella? That the economy hasn't changed for a long time. Like it's quite old, like an old system. Mm hmm. Okay, that's, boring and old. That's, that's good. You know, that's a boring and old. Zara, did you have your hand up? Yeah, but actually, I had the same idea. Yeah, that is correct. Traditional economies are pretty old economies, ancient. If we were to give a definition, I think so, it's the allocation of scarce resources and basically all economic activity is based on ritual habits or customs so these ritual habits and customs are usually formed with a you know a century or even more of history that are hard to change say for example the indian caste system so it is a formed system a formed economy that is hard to adjust say to a command or a market system so it's all traditional. So it's kind of, you know, literally what it means. Yeah, another example of a traditional economy is let's say the Indians, the Indians in America before, before Colombia founded the state, that is a traditional economy with these small villages within very pretty underdeveloped to the modern world is traditional. Do you guys, get a basic idea what it means. That's what a traditional economy is. And think about what traditional economy is and what do you guys think it should, some advantages that the traditional economy have? Yeah. So in a traditional economy, everyone has their own role. That's one thing to consider. So it's a set role. So like say in an in Indian caste system, right? If you're born into a monarchy, you are a monarchy. And if you are born into being a, maybe a slave, you're a slave. So that's something unique about traditional economies. Okay, and okay, just to add on, the traditions are taught by usually the kids, their parents. So farmers would be creating more farmers. You know, in a traditional economy, if you were born to a farmer's family, you likely to become a farmer because your parents teach you to become a farmer. And for whom is typically predetermined by some uh, hierarchical scale that everyone follows. So, so in talking about advantages, do you guys have anything in mind? Like what is some pros about traditional economy? What are some pros? They don't need to worry about finding or keeping up with trends, wants, need, or even resources. Yes, that's correct. Don't worry about it. They can just, you know, follow their earlier generation's habits. Okay, Ella? They already know how resources are going to be distributed and they just know how the system works already. That's mm -hmm. correct. That's very good. So everyone um, knows which role they play and they typically skip, stick to it, right? And another one is that the traditions are taught by parents to kids. So a skilled worker will create more skilled workers. So there will never be an absent job position. So that's an advantage. Yeah. 
And then another one would be for whom is typically already determined on this hierarch hierarchical scale. And their economic goals are economic stability and security. So features of traditional economies is mainly focused on farming, fishing, hunting, and gathering. And economic goals are that economic stability and security. Yeah. So if the traditional economies nowadays don't really exist in modern society anymore, but it's still kept in, you know, older tribes or older caste systems or older communities that have a lot of older people who wants to keep their traditions of passing on, you know, one's skill or their job position. Mm -hmm. so. Does anyone have any questions about traditional economies? That's the first, that's the first type of economy we learned today before we move on to another type of economy. Yes, Sarah. Sarah. I'm sorry, Rena, can you just please repeat the goals? I have the security here, but I didn't get the second word. Yeah, the two goals are economic stability, stable stability, mm -hmm. and security. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess we can move on. The next type is command economies. Amy, do you want to define command okay. economies? So command economy is where one central authority makes the decision concerning what, how, and for whom. So this central is communism. So the central government decides for everyone. Yes, Gino, you know, it's communism. So typically this authority is the government and the citizens the government and the citizens has little to no say in the decision process, what, how, and for whom. So this is the decision process. And a very typical example would be North Korea. I think a lot of people are unfamiliar with this country because they are very blocked from the outside world. And especially for people living in the United States, we know that North Korea and America has been long-term enemies because of this controlling and, and a lot of political issues. But in North Korea, the president gets to decide everything and the people has no say. So that's a very classic command economy example. Yeah, and the three, again, the three essential questions in economics is, um, to whom to produce for and what to produce and how to, produce, how to produce. Decisions about what, how, and for whom to produce are made by a powerful ruler for some authority. As what Amy said, command economies is when a powerful ruler makes the decision of, is the, like this powerful ruler answers the three essential questions. And the ruler at the top of early civilizations can command the populace uh, to decode the economic resources to build uh, projects or military ventures. That's correct. Yeah, that's what a command economy is. And their economic goals, the command economic goals is to accumulate wealth and goods for the ruling class while preserving economic stability. In simple words, that their economic goal is to gather wealth and goods for the ruling class, for the upper class, for the ruler, like for the, the government, the, the people working for, the, for government. the government. And at the same time, to, to still have economic stability, that's their goal. And just talking about the difference between command and traditional and in the next one we're going to be talking about, comparatively, command economies are going to have much better you know, infrastructure and public resources because they have one government ruling over all. 
and the world government can make its own decisions about you know the infrastructure and what to give the public so while wanting to maintain this public stability they will use the money within the government the single government to create wealth for all which, which is different than the next one we're going to talk about which is the same as america where you know there's multiple governments so they're trying to all get in favor of themselves. So it is hard to distribute that wealth to the public. Yes, and let's talk about some pros and cons of command economies to wrap this up. Um, some advantage, some pros of command economies are that you can make drastic changes in a relatively short amount of time because there's only one central government, one central ruler. If this ruler says one thing, it happens. So you can change things dramatically within a short amount of time. That's one advantage. Another advantage is little certainty. People do not have to worry about uh, where they will work, where they'll live, or what, what they will buy. So people in the command economy don't really have much to worry about because the government's already made the decision for them. They don't have to make all these decisions. The government's made the decision for them. Another advantage is education, healthcare, and other public services are typically provided at no cost to the people because they're all provided by the government because the government is right. And the government author often provides for public good, which gives the advantage of education, healthcare, and public services. And to move on to some disadvantage, some cons of command economy is that there's a little to zero freedom say the government say, oh, you have to buy your groceries from Costco because there's no other places that sell groceries. You have no freedom to choose because the decision is already made for you. The disadvantage is there is no decision for you to make. There's no freedom to choose. So the essential disadvantage for command economy is that there's no potential. People don't hope or don't try to work harder for a higher paying job because unless you're part or in the government, it is hard to you know, go from a working class people, person to you know, a higher level slide. Market economy. Okay, we know what a market is. We know what a market is in market has to have a producer and a consumer for a market to occur. Any ideas for a market economy? So when you consider economies, all these types of economies, you want to think about the three questions, what, how, and for whom. So how does market economy relate to those, do you think? Is it just kind of the same as what we were talking about before, but it's on a smaller scale because a market isn't as large as a country's economy and it's probably going to be like the same questions and everything, but it's just going to be like different answers and different ways of, I don't know, like solving them. This is a, a good way of thinking, but uh, right now these type of economies are applied in different governments. So a market economy is applied to one country's government while command is to another. So each government decides of their economy. Uh, Zara? Zara? Uh, I more thought about the questions and I came out of with a thought that if we will ask, what will we produce? We will find a certain group of things then how we will probably think how will we get i don't know these oranges to every part of this country so everybody so everyone can buy it and then for whom the next question is like who will buy them do kids want oranges or do just women want on want oranges or just companies because they want to make i don't know juices juices out of them i thought more about the questions yeah, I like how you're mm -hmm. going down to the individuals. Yes, um, so yeah, that's partially correct. But to define what a market economy is, is when people are, and firms are acting in their best own best interest in addressing these questions. 
like the people, the consumers and the producers, they answer these questions. Individuals could answer these questions. Typically in the market economy, the government has little to zero involvement. So let's say I am a part of a market economy. I decide what I buy. I can decide which grocery store I go to. I can decide which type of iPhone I want to buy, or I can decide um, what job I want to work into. And if I were a producer in a market economy, I can decide whatever I want to produce. I can decide what kind of business I want to start. I can decide what kind of customers I want to sell my products to. And market, these arrangements allow buyer and sellers to come together to exchange goods and services. And the king and queen in a market economy are the customers, are the individuals. Each people satisfy themselves and they get to make each decision within their life. Yeah, so differently while market is an arrangement which allows buyers and sellers to come together to exchange goods. In a command economy comparatively, it's different. It's the government and the individuals. The governments are telling the individuals, oh, you can come here, you can buy that. This is an exchange. While in a market, each individual gets to decide for themselves. So that's a major difference. And I think market and command can have you know, a direct opposite to each other, while traditional is something outside of the triangle. <laughs> The consumers are the power in a market economy. They're the kings and queens. They get to decide the market flow. So, yeah, and most economies nowadays have part of market economies. Well, a lot of economies nowadays, it's never directly just one economy. It's never just, oh, this is traditional economy. Oh, this is command economy. Oh, this is market economy. There's always a mix of a different, two different types, but lenient towards one. So most markets nowadays are lenient towards market economies. Most people have the freedom in deciding, you know, what, what I want and how I want to spend my money. And the main advantage in market economies is freedom, right? Individual freedom. It's my money and I want to, I can do whatever I want with it. I can spend it on food, I can go start a company, or I can invest it. Individual freedom is the biggest advantage uh, in market economies. And another advantage is it can adjust to continue to provide the needs of people. Like in a market economy, the businesses, while they well adjust according to what the people need, because if they don't adjust, they will go out of business. So the customers in a market economy will always get the products that they will probably need because there will be businesses to provide it. And again, in theory, there's a very, very small degree of government interference. And in theory, a small, like the wealth control power is uh, decentralized. Everyone has a voice in a, how the economy should run. So in the market economy, everyone typically has a voice in how the economy should run. And the biggest advantage is freedom. Okay. And again, to adding on to the advantages is that there's a tremendous variety of goods and services that an individual can choose from. Because there are so many businesses providing these uh, goods and services, the customers also have a variety of choice to choose from, the freedom to choose from what type of apple they want or what brand of banana they want, okay? Yeah. And yeah, and because consumers have freedom and variety, satisfaction around citizens is typically very high. That's correct. And in addition, so this variety choice gives the market a result of competition niche and invention which is like america america is a, a market economy and these competition within the same companies that are in the industry creates the motive for invention 
And that's why America, mm-hmm. within just you know a little over two centuries of history, was able to grow so dramatically so, fast because of the competition that created the motive for creativity. Yeah. And does anyone have questions about what a market economy is and the advantages before I move on to the disadvantages? I know it's a lot of information to take in today. This is a lot of, when I was taking this class and my head was like not hurting because yeah. the amount so of information. Next time, yeah, next time we can list some important points on the slideshow so we can have a little more reference. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and if no one has any questions, I'm gonna move on to the disadvantage of market economies. So one of the biggest disadvantage is what if you do not have any money or services to exchange? What if you're too poor, too sick, too old, or too young? Like in a command economy, if you're too poor, that wouldn't happen because you are provided with healthcare. You're provided with housing, provided with everything you might need. But in a market economy, you have the freedom to choose. But what if you choose, but you have to pay for it, right? What if you don't have money? You're too sick, too old, too young. Those are some disadvantages of the market economy. And there will be competition for a certain position. And if you don't get chosen for that position, although you had a choice, it is hard for you to, you know, adapt in the economy very quickly. So that's just a disadvantage. Yes, and that concludes market economy. Wait, I think that concludes the three types of economies. Okay, in conclusion, the three types of economies, traditional, command, and market. Command, communism. Uh, wait, which one would you say socialism, Amy? Which economy is socialism? I think command partly can be socialism, like Switzerland, Finland, those are partly socialism, but they're also the they're also part of command uh, systems. And looking at yeah. American history where you know Eugene Debs led the Socialist Party, that party did not last because America mm-hmm. was aiming for a market economy. So yeah, and market economies are typically capitalism, right? Capitalism, freedom, <laughs> right? Freedom, capitalism. So that will be an introduction to our next meeting. We're going to be talking about capitalism, uh, the U.S. economy, the freedom, and how everything works. Uh, yeah, so basically capitalism, competition. That's not going to be our topic for next meeting. So... If you have any questions, uh, feel free to stay and ask. And if you do not, you're free to go. Yeah, and again, this is a lot of information. If you want me to repeat anything over again, I am happy to do so. Uh, And we do want to make sure that you understand these three types of economies. They're going to apply a lot in our future uh, learning.